Okay, so it's 11.30 now, so we're going to get started. So today we're going to be doing our first lecture for kind of the theory portion for the lab. So this will be the lecture for our very first lab, which is on stress and strain with a focus on the extensometer. Okay, so you can click on the module for this lab. Click on week two, take you to today's page. You can get the slides from here or you can get them from the files tab over here. And here's the schedule for today. So the before we actually start writing notes, I'm going to go back to VKS, which we kind of looked at last week, but I'm going to go over that in a little more depth today to give you a preview of what the first lab is going to be like. And uh, next week, when we meet in person in E42, we're going to briefly talk about the lab in the class, and then we're going to head over to the actual lab. And also when we meet in class, we're going to break off into groups of four groups of four to five people per group. And then when we go over to the lab, I'm going to give you guys a demo so you can actually see how to set, set everything up and actually run the experiment. And since we're talking about the lab, make sure that you have your safety glasses and make sure you bring a mask because you got to wear it inside. And then also make sure you're wearing closed toed shoes. Okay. Okay. So for VKS, the login and the password, it's from, it's, it's a uh, school wide. Okay. So the username is here. The password is right here. Okay. So I already have this opened up. So this is for the very first lab. Also, uh, Dr. Siyoshi made some updated uh, procedures for this lab. Basically, it's the, it's the exact same as what we have here in VKS, except uh, for the pictures where it shows software, those are updated for the new software that we have in the lab. So I'm going to upload those procedures sometime this weekend on Canvas, and you can take a look at it. Again, the only difference is the pictures for the uh, software. Okay, so the very first part uh, for the lab, again, just, I guess, some very brief background. What we're doing in this lab is we're, we're going to have three different metals. So we have aluminum 660 or 6061 T6, and then we have 1018 steel and 1045 steel. And we're going to take all of those metals. Uh, they're going to be in the shape of a rod, and we're going to run them through a tension test until each of them breaks. Okay. So the first thing that we're going to do, uh, you don't need to measure this length. I don't really know why it's in here. You don't have to do that. Uh, but you do need to measure the diameter. So for each test specimen that we have, there's this kind of tapered section. And you're going to measure the diameter in these three different locations, then take the average of them. Okay, so we have some calipers in the lab that um, that are at each station, so you're going to use that to measure the diameter. Okay, this is our machine that we're going to be using for five out of the six labs. We're going to change the fixtures, you know, depending on the experiment that we're running. Okay, the first thing to, to kind of set everything up is we are going to look at the very top jaw that we have, or the upper jaw. We're going to take the test specimen that we have and we're going to insert it into the jaw, leave about a quarter of an inch of space, and then we're going to tighten it down with this T handle here. And you want to make sure that you don't over tighten it. Uh, you don't need to go crazy, just make it nice and snug, and, uh, and that's it. Okay, then you are going to take this hand controller here and you're going to press this lock button until you get this green light. If you see the green light, that means that the uh, control of the machine is on the hand controller itself. And uh, so once we have that green light, we can press uh, these arrows to manipulate how this top jaw is going to move. So we can press this down arrow and the top jaw is going to go down. And these arrows, they, they are our macro adjustments. So it's going to move this top jaw reasonably fast. And later on, we're going to apply a preload 
And to do that, we're going to use this scroll wheel, which is for really small micro adjustments. Okay, so you're going to lower this top jaw down and make sure that this uh, specimen is lined up so it's not going to hit anything on its way down. And you're going to make sure that it's nice and concentric with this uh, a little hole here. And again, you're going to leave about a quarter of an inch here. And then you're going to tighten this bottom jaw. And then uh, your specimen is set up. It's nice and snug. And of course, we need to use our extensometer here. Remember that this is going to measure the deformation that we have for each specimen. So to set this up, we need to get our extensometer and there is two blades here and we need to make sure that they're, that they're lined up with the specimen. So looking at this picture, this bottom one looks good. It's nice and centered. This top one, it, it might be hard from the angle to tell, but it looks like it's only touching the specimen on the left hand side of the blade. Um, so that's not good. And they fix that and then in the next image, but you want to make sure it's nice and centered. If it's off center, that's going to affect the readings that you have for the deformation. All right, so you see here, they, they lined it up a bit better. And to actually lock the extensometer onto the specimen, you use these clips. They uh, it, it doesn't look like it's really secure, but trust me, it is. It, it's actually a nice snug fit. And it'll stay on to the specimen that way. Okay, so now we're going to apply preload with this scroll wheel. So you're going to go to about 10 pounds. You don't need to be perfect. You just want to apply a small preload. And that's to uh, make sure that we don't have any slack. Basically, we want to make sure that we are already headed in the right direction. In this case, that's going to be uh, with tension. And this is uh, something that you, you need to really be sure that you use the scroll wheel at this part to apply the preload. Because if you use the arrows, instead of applying like 10 pounds of force, you're going to be applying hundreds and hundreds of pounds of force. And you may very well um, even already fracture the material. That's not going to be good. So make sure that you use the scroll wheel when you apply the preload. I'm going to reiterate that to you once we're actually in the lab. So when you're all ready to go, you've applied the preload. At this point, you're going to remove this safety pin, which basically locks this extensometer in place where it can't deform. So the extensometer starts at an original length of two inches. So that's what you see here. And after we apply the preload, we're going to be ready to do our test. So of course, we want the extensometer to deform at the same rate as our material that's being tested. So we're going to remove this safety pin very gently, and that'll allow us to have this deform. Okay, so you're going to go back to your computer. Uh, again, you know, I haven't used the new software yet. I'm going to take a look at it on next Tuesday. But I imagine the procedure is very similar for the software where we need to zero everything out before we actually run the test. So we're going to zero out the load here. That's the preload that we applied. And the extensometer box, which we see over here, we're going to make sure that we zero that out as well. Uh, you can zero out the crosshead, but in this case, it's um, not really relevant for this experiment. OK, uh, last thing you have to do is press the lock button on the hand controller again. That's going to move control of the machine from the hand controller back to the computer. And then uh, uh, this you probably should have already done, but you want to make sure that the jaws, they are nice and snug. And then we can press play and that's going to run our test. So you can already see here it's starting to apply a load and it will continue to apply a load, you know, until our specimen breaks. And once it breaks, you're going to see a fracture surface that's similar to this. This looks like it's one of the steel specimens that we have. It's more of a 
um, a clean cut surface. It's not, you know, totally a clean cut surface, but it's pretty, uh, pretty clean cut. So aluminum is going to be a little different. We're going to see what that'll look like in a bit. All right, going to take your extensometer off and you're going to put the safety pin back in. So it's going to, you know, go back to two inches. And then one of the last things that we need to do is take both halves of our specimen and we're going to kind of fit them back together and we're going to measure this diameter at that fracture surface with, with the caliper again. So, you know, we measured the diameter in the beginning and we're going to measure the diameter at the end at this fracture surface and we're going to use both of those as a way to uh, quantify the ductility of each material. And you see there's a very noticeable necking region, right? So uh, you can see that the cross-sectional area, it decreases as we go along here. It's the same here. You can see it kind of decrease and it has a very concentrated area of this decreased cross-sectional area. Okay, and this is the aluminum uh, fracture so you see that there's a cup and cone fracture rather than that previous picture we saw where it's kind of a smooth cut if you have a more ductile material you can have a what's called a cup and cone fracture that's because it's uh, elongating more before it breaks okay and that's what you're going to be doing so you're going to do that three times because we have three different materials and that will be your experiment as for collecting the data, I mean, I'm sound like a broken record now, but I'm not sure what it's like on the new software, but I imagine it's the same where basically it's going to load data in the software and then we're going to save that data to a folder on the desktop. That's what we've done in semesters past. And then I'm going to collect the data myself on a flash drive that I have, and then I'll upload it to Canvas later that day. The lab technician does not want you to use your own flash drive, so um, don't bother bringing one, basically. Okay, so any questions on the lab procedures before we get started on the actual theory for today? <clears throat> okay. So what I'm gonna do now is share my iPad screen. So my video, my webcam is gonna go away. I'm gonna to try to find a better solution for this. I don't like Zoom's uh, incorporation, I guess, of how they use the webcam. I hate having their huge big ass block in the recording. So anyways, uh, for this lecture, my webcam is gonna go away for a lot of it. Okay. And then again, the, uh, the slides are on Canvas if you want to take a look at those. Okay, so um, for those of you that are taking your solid mechanics class this semester, at least according to my class I had earlier today, you guys have only kind of briefly talked about stress and strain and uh, gone over the stress strain curve. So um, if you haven't gone into it in too much depth yet in your class, that's okay. Uh, we're going to be going over a lot of the theory today and Hopefully, you know, once you go over in more depth in your actual class, you'll kind of have a lot of these to uh, topics and theories, whatever, uh, kind of reinforced. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is stress. So, you know, it's going to be a very basic definition. I'm sure everyone knows what stress is, whether intuitively or you've seen it in your physics classes before or whatever. You know what stress is. But we're still going to write out the definition. So that's simply going to be a force that's applied over a given cross-sectional area. Okay. 
Ken, if you ever can't read my handwriting, you can let me know. You can ask me what I wrote. I, I've noticed it kind of gets worse as I go on in the lecture, not by, you know, I'm not doing it intentionally, but it just kind of happens. Okay, another way that we can think about force or stress is we can say that stress is the intensity of the force that we have. Okay, and then for us, we have our bar. There we go, that's better. And we're going to be applying tension to this. Okay, so P, uh, that's our force. You can call it F, call it whatever you want. That's going to be our force. And this force is being applied over the cross-sectional area that we have on our rod. So if we look at our top section, of course, it's going to be, you know, um, if we're looking at that kind of slice, our force P is being applied over that entire cross-sectional area. So if we look at the equation for stress, that's going to be given by sigma. So sigma equals F over A, where sigma, that's our stress. F, that's our force. A is our cross-sectional area. The units are going to be in PSI or pound force per inch squared. So uh, uh, sorry if you, if you love your SI units, we're using US units in the lab. That's how it's set up in the software. So uh, you're going to have to deal with that. All right, and then as we increase our force, which we're going to be doing, of course, in the lab, you can tell that our stress is going to increase. And as the stress increases, well, there's going to be a certain point uh, where our material can't handle that stress anymore, and it's going to fracture. Okay. So at uh, the next slide... I'm all the way at the bottom here. So the next slide, we've already kind of looked at those fracture surfaces on VKS, so I'm not going to go over that. So now let's talk about strain. Okay, so stress and strain, they're going to make up, uh, you know, they're the basic components of, of course, our stress strain diagram, which is going to give us a lot of information about the materials that we're testing. Okay, so the definition for strain, it's, it's a way to describe an object's deformation, or in this case, since we're looking at a tension test, it's a way to describe the change in length or the elongation of our rods that we're testing. And just like stress, we said that we could also describe that as the intensity of the force that's applied for strain. We can describe this as the intensity of the deformation that we have. So if an object has elongated more than some other object, it, it's going to have gone under more strain. Okay, just as with stress, as we increase our force, the strain is also going to increase as we increase the force. The equation for strain is given by epsilon is equal to delta L over LIN. So epsilon, that's strain. Delta L, that's our change in length or our deformation or elongation, whatever you want to call it. L underscore IN, that's going to be our original length of the rod. So we have a change in length over the original length. So they're both in units of inch. So that means that strain is unitless. Even though it's unitless, you'll often see people will still write out the units, even though they cancel out. They'll still write them out so you, the reader, you know uh, what units were used to measure that deformation. Okay, so for us, that'll be 
uh, strain is going to be in units and kind of quotes here of inch per inch. All right. So those are the very basic definitions of stress and strain. And we're going to be calculating both of those. So for stress, you know, all we need is the force, which we're going to be given that from our software. We can see how the force is increasing over time. And then we also have the cross-sectional area because we measured that in the beginning of the lab. So then we can calculate uh, stress. And for strain, we um, our original length, that's going to be the what's called the gauge length of our extensometer. So remember, our extensometer has an original length of two inches. So that's what we're going to use in our strain calculation. I'll actually write that down. Okay, so that's going to be our original length and then our change in length that's given by the extensometer as it feeds that information back to the computer. So remember the extensometer is deforming at the exact same rate as our specimen. So, the, so we have, uh, you know, these methods to calculate both stress and strain. And from that, we can make a plot, which is going to be our stress strain diagram. Okay, so we just talked about it, but just to reiterate, we're going to obtain this diagram by converting load and area data to stress and then uh, converting deformation and orig original length data to strain. Okay, and there's an important reason that we're actually doing this conversion, right? So if we're just looking at the load and deformation data, and we make a plot of that, uh, that's only giving us information on that unique material. So if we kind of take out all of the geometric properties of that unique material, like the length and the cross-sectional area, and we convert that our load and deformation data to stress and strain, Instead of looking at only the, or getting insights on a unique uh, specimen, we can get insights on the material properties as a whole. So what I mean by that is, let's say we do a, a tensile test of some aluminum material. And one of our specimens for this aluminum is longer than the other. That doesn't matter. If we do a stress strain test for both of those different unique specimens for that given material, our stress strain curve is going to be the same. You know, for all intents and purposes, it's going to be the same. And then we can uh, find material properties such as the elastic modulus from our stress strain diagram. Okay, so doing this conversion, it takes out, um, or it, it allows us to get insights on the material as a whole. Okay, so now I'm going to draw just some arbitrary stress strain curve. You'll see that depending on the material, the stress strain curve can look um, different. 
But in general, it's going to follow a trend. Of course, we're increasing in stress. And then eventually, we're going to uh, have a fracture. So on the y-axis, we have our stress given by sigma. The x-axis is going to be our strain given by epsilon. And for now, I'm going to label some of the important regions and points, and we're going to go over all of these in detail. So the first one, okay, in this region in red, this is going to be our elastic range. So as the name implies, it's going to be a range where our material is going to behave elastically, which will be talked about in the next slide. Okay, and I'll draw a little point here, and I'm going to call this the elastic limit. Okay, after our elastic limit, we're going to have a yield point. And then after we yield for some time, we're going to reach our ultimate tensile strength. So that's going to be the maximum stress that our material can handle. Okay, and this is often given by the uh, acronym of UTS, so ultimate tensile strength. And then we're going to have our fracture point at the very end, as you would assume. And one more region is going to be in between the ultimate tensile strength and our fracture point. And this is going to be called the necking. And necking refers to the reduction in cross-sectional area and a kind of localized region of our specimen. So you already saw that earlier on on VKS, but we'll discuss this in more depth, why it occurs and uh, in how it affects the, the strength and the fracture for our material. Okay, so any questions so far at this point? Okay, so the first thing we'll talk about is elasticity. Okay, so there's going to be a few things that we need to talk about for elasticity. First, we'll just do a basic definition of what we mean by elasticity. And that's going to be the ability for a material to return to the exact same original dimensions after we load it some amount and then unload it. So, you know, I can load it maybe, let's say 20 pounds and it's going to deform, it's going to elongate a bit. And if I unload those 20 pounds that we just applied, we can recover all of that elongation, all of that strain that we just had. It's going to return to the exact same original dimensions. It's going to be as if we never applied a load at all. So you can think of that like a rubber band, right? You can stretch that rubber band out. And if you release that force that you just put on it, it's going to return to its exact same spot. Of course, this is going to be up to a limit. At some point, there's going to be some force that we, where we exceed this force where we can no longer return to our um, original geometric dimensions.
Okay. So what I'm going to do now is kind of draw uh, like a zoomed in portion of our stress drain curve so we can focus on this elastic range. Let's see, I'll draw it down here, I guess. Okay, so we have one more thing that we wanna define, which is gonna be the proportional limit. So if you've already uh, talked about this in your solid mechanics class, uh, good, hopefully you have. So this proportional limit is when the linear region in our elastic range ends. So linear region or relationship, whatever you want to call it, when that ends. So if we look at our stress drain diagram down here, that's you know zoomed in. At the very end of this black curve, you see the black curve. That's that's linear that entire time. At the very end there, that's going to be where our proportional limit is. So right here, I'm going to label that PL for proportional limit. At that point, our curve is no longer linear. So the relationship between stress and strain, it's no longer linear. And that's going to be important later on because we're going to use this linear relationship to uh, find our elastic modulus, which we're going to compare to published values. And the, of course, the elastic modulus, that is a way to quantify a material stiffness. We'll also talk about that in a bit. Okay, another definition is the elastic limit. So we're looking at the elastic range here. The elastic range, remember, that's um, when we can load a material to some amount and then we can unload it and we can recover all of that strain so we can get back to our very original dimensions. So that's the elastic range, but now we're going to define the elastic limit. And that's going to be what we basically just said. This is going to be uh, the point where our elastic range ends. Okay, so here I'm going to label this on our curve with, I guess, purple. Let's say that's up here. Okay. okay, so this, what we have here in this entire range, it's the elastic range, okay, this curve. because okay, remember the elastic limit that's the point where our elastic range is going to end and when we have a linear relationship between stress and strain it's going to behave elastically uh, within that region so you can see that the proportional limit and the elastic limit in this example they're at different points on our stress strain curve for most materials they're going to be the, the exact same point or it's going to be the difference between them is going to be so negligible that for all intents and purposes, the proportional limit and the elastic limit are going to be the same. But there are some materials that are a little funky, like what I just drew here. And I just want, I did this to emphasize that the proportional limit and the elastic limit, they, they can be a little different. It just depends on the material. So the takeaway here is that some materials, 
They can be, they can have a non-linear relationship between stress and strain, and they can still behave elastically. So even though we have this non-linear relationship there, some materials can still behave elastically. Okay, so let's write that down. So for most materials, The proportional limit and the elastic limit is going to be at the same uh, point. Okay, and then our last kind of point I want to make here is that some materials can behave elastically after the proportional limit. And that's when our stress strain relationship is nonlinear. Okay, so I just want to make that kind of differentiation because you might see that occasionally in some textbooks where the proportional limit is different than the elastic limit. I think in some textbooks, they, they might not even mention this. So they might just show the proportional limit or they might just show the elastic limit. But you do want to keep in mind just for reference that for some materials, you can go past the proportional limit and a material can still behave elastically, even though it's nonlinear. But this is only up to the elastic limit, as its name would imply. All right, the next thing is going to be the yield point. Right. And the basic definition for this is going to be, this is going to be a point on a stress strain curve where we're going to have a very small or even no increase in stress, but we're going to have a very large increase in strain. All right, and because this is a point on the graph, this yield point, it can be different than where our elastic limit is. So even though our, you know, right after our elastic limit, our material is gonna start to behave in a non-elastic way or a plastic way, meaning that there's gonna be permanent deformation after this, um, the yield point can be, <clears throat> can be a little after the elastic limit, because remember, it's just the point on our curve where there is very little or no increase in stress and there's a large increase in strain. <clears throat> I forgot, I did want to put up here when we were talking about elasticity that anything after that elastic limit, we're going to behave in a plastic manner, meaning that there's permanent deformation. So let's just add that as well.
Okay, so that's, you know, our product def deformation is going to be when we enter the plastic region of our graph. All right, so let's draw kind of two different uh, representations of a yield point. So we're going to draw two different curves on our stress strain diagram. So for one of these, we'll draw something like this. Okay, and then for another one, we're going to draw something like that. Uh, no, let's change it. I want it to be a little more obvious. Okay, so in black here, we have a very obvious point where our yield point is. So you see that we're increasing in stress. But we get to a point where there's very little, or in this case, no increase in stress. In fact, we're kind of decreasing a bit. And that's going to be where our yield point is. So that's going to be right here. Okay, so we're increasing and increasing in stress. And we get to a point where there's little to no increase in stress, and there's a very large increase in the strain that we have. So that's material one and for that black curve. And for material two on our blue curve, we also reach a point where there's going to be very little uh, increase in stress, but there's going to be a very large increase in strain. Okay, and that'll be right there as well in red. Okay, so the black material that's a, a much more defined yield point, but you can still see where the yield point is on this blue curve as well. Uh, but for some materials, this yield point, it's not going to be very obvious. It's going to be kind of hard to determine when this yielding uh, occurs because we're going to transition very gradually from when we're in our elastic range to our plastic range. So we can actually draw that on here as well. So on that green curve, there's no definitive or really easily marked location where we have this uh, negligible increase in stress and a large increase in strain. This whole time, well, maybe, well, yeah, the whole time we are adding strain, of course, but it's hard to differentiate where our elastic region or our linear region is going to end and the plastic region is beginning because it's such a gradual transition here. So in this case on the green curve, it's not obvious where that yield point is. So instead we're going to use something called yield strength. Okay, so again, we're going to use the yield strength for uh, materials that, that don't have a well-defined yield point, because we still want to be able to quantify uh, when this yielding is occurring, but if it's not obvious when this yield point occurs, we need some other metric to define this, and that'll be the yield strength. Okay, and this is going to be defined by something called uh, permanent set. So there's going to be some very specific amount of permanent set. And we're going to look at that permanent set, and that will be used to help us determine where that yield strength is. So I know that sounds like really vague right now, but we're going to write that down first, then I'll show you how to actually find this.
Okay, so we're going to use a permanent set of 0.2%. So it's often given in terms of percentage, but really this just means a strain of 0 0.002 inch per inch, or, you know, meters per meter, centimeter per centimeter, whatever your units are. Also, another metric is point, I want to say 0.05%. Uh, that's less common though from what I've seen. So we're going to use a permanent set of 0.2% or really just a strain of 0 0.002 inch per inch. So, you know, of course that's a very small amount of strain. And then to find our yield strength, we're going to be looking at our stress strain diagram. Okay, so let's say that that is our stress strain curve that we have here. I just realized that I had my, my mouse in the way. Okay, so anyways, we have um, our stress strain curve right there. And then what we're going to do um, is we're going to look at our permanent set. Again, that's a, a 0 0.002 inch per inch. We're going to find that on our x-axis. So let's say that that's right here. And then what we're going to do is we're going to look at the linear region of our stress strain curve. So we're going to be going from the origin to our proportional limit. And we're going to draw a line that's parallel to that, starting from our permanent set location. Okay, and then we're going to look at that intersection point for that line we just drew. And we're going to see one that intersects our stress strain curve. And the stress that corresponds to that point is going to be our yield strength. Okay, so some little dashed lines there that's going to correspond to sigma uh, subscript ys for yield strength. So for us in MATLAB, we're going to be doing this, um, you know, as a class. So I'll be going over this with you for the for the first lab, where we kind of go over this together. I'm not sure for you know for the other labs, I'm still going to help you out, um, but I won't be like sorry, sorry the Discord notifications. So I'm not going to be. Um, like, I don't want to hold your hand for MATLAB, but I know there's a lot of people that aren't super confident in MATLAB. Hopefully you don't feel that way if you had me before, but for the very first lab, for sure, we're going we're gonna to be going over all of it as a class. And I'll show you guys how we can, um, you know, do this kind of in an, I guess in quotes here, an automated way in MATLAB to find this yield strength where we can find and we can tell MATLAB to directly give us the value where that intersection point is. So there's going to be no eyeballing, basically. All right, so that's the yield strength. Are there any questions so far? Okay. All right, next thing we're going to talk about is the ultimate tensile strength. I'm not even going to write anything down here just because it's so intuitive and just obvious of, of what that is. So that's going to be the maximum amount of stress that our material can handle. So you see on this picture here in red, our brittle material, it goes all the way up to the top. That's our ultimate tensile strength. And because it's brittle, there's not really much deformation. It just breaks there. Or there's not much strain in this case. Our next one, the black line, again, you're going to go to the highest point on that stress strain curve, and that's the ultimate tensile strength. And same thing with our plastic material. Look at the highest point. That's your UTS. Okay. All right, next thing that we have is necking. So we've mentioned the necking a few times so far. Let's talk about it in a bit more depth. OK, 
Okay, so I guess first I'm just going to describe it and then I'll write some stuff down. So remember that, um, you know, as we apply a load to our rods, a tensile load, our rod is going to lengthen. So it's going to increase in length. And because it's increasing in length by conservation of mass, that means that our cross-sectional area on that rod has to decrease. And it's going to decrease pretty uniformly throughout. Okay, so of course, we still have the same mass for our rod, but once we lengthen it, cross-sectional area, that's going to decrease. As we continue to lengthen this rod, um, in, the, in the very center of our rod, there's going to be an area there where the cross-sectional area, it actually decreases at a faster rate than the rest of the rod. And, and that localized area, that's going to be called necking. And it's going to continually decrease and decrease and decrease. And because that cross-sectional area is decreasing, our stress is going to keep increasing localized in that area. And then we're going to fracture right there because there's a very high concentration of stress there. All right, so that was a lot of things. So let's write some of that down. Sorry, that was my headphones. Okay, there we go. So just to reiterate, as we apply our tensile load, our entire rod is going to lengthen. And because the rod is lengthening, we need to, of course, maintain our mass. So the cross-sectional area of the whole rod is going to decrease fairly uniformly. Um, but as we can continue to increase our load, the this kind of central region of a rod it's this localized small region it's going to decrease an area faster than the rest of the rod and that is termed necking so we can also kind of draw this out these little numbers here I'll draw them out like this okay so there's our rod in the beginning so Actually, I guess I'll call this zero. Okay, so no load has been applied yet. Now we're gonna apply some load and our rod is going to, um, I guess this will be one and two. I'm gonna show that it's both lengthening and decreasing in cross-sectional area. Okay, so we have um, increased our length by delta L and we've decreased in our cross-sectional area. And then our third point here, when we're gonna have necking that occurs. And we're also gonna, uh, of course, um, the entire rod is still lengthening and the entire rod is still decreasing in cross-sectional area. Okay, so there's delta L again, and you see in the in the center, we have necking, and eventually we're going to fracture where that necking takes place. And to understand this, you know, we have our force that is continually increasing, but we also have in this necking region, we have our area that's decreasing. And because that area is decreasing, that's also adding a contributing factor 
to our stress increasing. So it's increasing quite a lot in this necking region because of that, you know, it, it's shooting up real fast. So there's again, that concentration of stress and eventually our material can't handle that amount of stress and it's going to fracture at this region that we have for necking. Okay, and here you can look at some pretty good pictures that uh, show this. So the very first picture on the left, um, it wasn't labeled, but it looks like there is no load that has been applied yet to this section of the rod. In the second picture, you can see um, it's elongated a bit. And also, you can actually start to see that the cross-sectional area has decreased a bit. And overall, it's pretty uniform throughout this length of the rod. Um, but you can actually already see some tapering that's occurring for the, the, the kind of necking region. In the third picture, you can see a very clearly defined necking region now. And you can tell that it's about to fracture. And in the very last picture, it, I think it did fracture. And what they did is they took both halves and then they fit them back together. But it's a little hard to tell. Um, but I think it did fracture there. Okay, so that's kind of what necking is going to look like in our lab. I think it's pretty cool. And don't forget that when it breaks in the lab, it's going to be very loud. Uh, so uh, you kind of be prepared for that, but it's also hard to time because it's going to be decreasing in cross-sectional area. And you might be just kind of staring at it for a few minutes, wondering when it's going to like go off, you know? So it's funny to see everyone's reactions though. I love that. Okay, so one question that might occur, you know, maybe you've thought of it or your instructor for your solid mechanics class brought it up. Uh, but there's the question of why we're um, failing at a lower stress than we had at our ultimate tensile stress. Well, let's go down here. Okay, so why is our factor stress lower than our ultimate tensile strength? So over here is the fracture point. And here is our UTS. So of course, intuitively, it, that doesn't make sense, you know. Uh, we have this maximum stress at the UTS, but you'd think you know, we've been saying this whole time, we're going to continue to increase our stress. We're increasing the load, which increases the stress. At some point, the material can't handle that stress. It's going to fracture. So, you know, why the hell is the fracture stress lower than the UTS? What we've been assuming in our equations this whole time for calculating stress is that the area has been constant, which in reality we know is not true. But uh, really, it's, it's hard to measure that, basically. Um, there are some machines that do measure it, I think. I think I've seen some online, but that's pretty rare. And the standard practice for a stress strain diagram is, you know, incorporating, kind of baked into our equations for stress, is that the cross-sectional area is constant. So, you know, we have stress equals F over A. A in there, we've been assuming that that uh, was constant. Okay, I want to emphasize that we have assumed that it's constant in our equation. You know, we know that that's, that's not true. We, we can see necking occur. Of course, the area is changing. So the curve that we have here on our stress strain diagram that we're going to keep using, that's termed engineering stress. Uh, 
All right, and then if we draw a curve for what's actually going on in reality, in red there, um, you know, for the beginning portion of our experiment, the black curve and the red curve, they're going to be the same. But as we get around the UTS, you'll see that the red curve, you know, it's going up because guess what? Um, in reality, we are increasing the stress, and then at some point, that stress gets too high and we fracture. So this red curve, that's called true stress. Okay, so that's just something that you should keep in mind that, yes, in reality, the area is changing, but that's hard to measure. So because it's hard to continuously measure in our experiment, we just assume in our equations that the area is constant. Okay, next thing is the elastic modulus. Okay, so the elastic modulus, uh, you know, this is an important parameter that we need to solve for in our lab. But as basic definition, the elastic modulus is a method or it's a way to characterize a material's behavior in the elastic range. What I think is a better definition is that it's, it's a measure of a material stiffness. Okay, and this elastic modulus, uh, one of the reasons why it's important is that it gives us a way to predict and predict that's emphasized because that's not always going to be true, but it gives us a way to predict how a material is going to uh, deform under a load. All right, so um, circling back, one of the important things in this lab is calculating the elastic modulus from our stress strain curve, and we are going to compare what we get to published values. So we're calculating that for our 6061 T6 aluminum, 1018 steel, and 1045 steel. We're going to compare that to published values and, and see what our percent error is. So to calculate this, we're going to take a look at Hooke's Law. So we have sigma equals capital E. That's our elastic modulus. And that's multiplied by strain. So this relationship, it's a linear relationship. It's only applicable in our uh, <clears throat> elastic range. So I'm going to rewrite this to you. E equals sigma over epsilon okay so looking at our equation you know we can tell that that's a linear relationship so that's why it's only applicable in that elastic range or the linear portion of our stress strain curve. When we have a nonlinear relationship, it's no longer applicable because, well, stress and strain at that point, it's no longer um, linear, so we can't use this equation anymore. Okay, and to do this, let's see. Okay, I'll draw another one. Another stress strain curve. Kind of zoomed in though. Okay, so this is the linear portion of our stress strain curve. 
And to calculate our elastic modulus, well, let's look at our equation right here. That's sigma over epsilon. Well, that's just a rise over run on our, on our graph here. That's just the slope. Let's see, I'll do this like this. So we're going to have one point here. Okay, I'm going to call this uh, 2. We're going to have one point down here. I'm going to call that 1. And to calculate the elastic modulus, we have E equals sigma 2 minus sigma 1 all over epsilon 2 minus epsilon 1. And just, uh, you know, for your own, I guess, kind of note, keep this in mind that Make sure that when you're calculating this, you have a decent spread. So you have a, a good delta. You don't want to start it um, at a point where it's not very clear anymore if, if you're actually linear. So make sure that, you know, you're in this linear region and you're not at some point where it's like, I think it's still a linear line. No, you want to do it where you're very clearly um, within uh, the range to your proportional limit. So you want to make sure that the line is still linear and also so like that that would be your high bound to make sure that where point two is it's still again linear and point one just make sure you're not too close to the origin because even though we applied some preload there's going to be more noise in the very beginning of our test um from maybe there might still be some slack um and we want to avoid the impact of noise so we're going to go a little further away from the origin. Okay, and that's how we calculate the elastic modulus. All right, last thing we're going to be talking about today is ductility. And the simple definition for that is a material's capacity for plastic deformation, or how much strain can it endure? Uh, before it fractures. Okay, so as the name would kind of imply, a very ductile material that's going to be able to, uh, it's going to be able to deform quite a lot. It's going to have a lot of strain versus a brittle material that's not going to have a lot of strain before fracture. Okay, so let's take a look at this graph that we have. All right, so here we see our red curve. That's our ductile material. It has quite a lot of strain before it fractures. That's why it's ductile. The brittle material, it, it has a little bit of deformation. It has a bit of, um, of plastic deformation, I should be saying. Um, but it's not very much, so it's a brittle material. Uh, another thing to note is that ductility is not necessarily related to strength. That is often the case, as we'll see in the next slide, but it's that's not a, a hard and fast rule. It's not set in stone. I mean, as you see on this graph, both of these materials, of course, this is, you know, arbitrary, but both of these materials, they have the same strength but they have very different uh, ductilities, right? One is really ductile, one is not. 
But again, in general, there is usually or typically a correlation with ductility and strength. So as you know, there's a correlation that as a material gets stronger, typically it's not as ductile. So we'll look at all four of these uh, materials here. The number four, okay, so that's our bottom curve. That is very ductile. You know, there's a lot of plastic deformation that it has before it fractures, but it's also not that strong. A material three, you know, there's less plastic deformation, but it is stronger. And then material two, there's very, very little plastic deformation, um, you know, because we see there's very little of this nonlinear relationship, which would, for most materials, indicate plastic deformation. But it, it's pretty strong. And then material one, yeah, it's the most strong, but it's there's no ductility at all, really. If you look at the graph here, it's just it just has a linear relationship before it fractures. So there's no plastic deformation for that. Now, I mean, of course, it's not like one of these is worse than the other, right? It depends on your application. For some things, you might want something that's really strong, but it might be brittle. And for other things, you know, you might be better off with something that can go undergo a lot of strain, even if it's not that strong. So there's two different methods to quantify ductility. One is what we've been talking about in these past few slides. That's just the amount of plastic deformation that it has. Or really, we can just look at the strain at fracture. So of course, four, that's the most ductile. One is the least ductile. Because four is the most strain at fracture. Number one has the least amount of strain at fracture. Okay, and the second method is something called the percent reduction in area. That's cross-sectional area. And that's what we're going to be uh, calculating for this lab. Okay, so to do this, we're going to have two different measurements of our cross-sectional area. One of them you already have, um, you know, like pretend you already did the lab. So one of them you have from the get-go because you measured the diameter, you know, in three different spots, and you took the average diameter of the uh, specimen. Okay, so from that you can calculate the original cross-sectional area. And then the other area that we need is the cross-sectional area at fracture. So that's when we take both of our fractured pieces and kind of fit them together, use calipers to measure that diameter at the fracture surface, and then we can get the cross-sectional area of the fracture surface. Okay, so the equation to use here, I'm gonna call percent reduction in area PRA. So PRA, that's going to be equal to A0 minus A sub F all over A0. Okay, and then we're going to multiply that by 100 so we can get a percentage. And remember, A0, that's our original cross-sectional area. And then A sub F, that is our cross-sectional area at, at the fracture surface. Okay, so what we're going to do is basically compare these. Um, we're going to be looking at these numbers, and we're going to see um, from the materials that we have, which one is more ductile than the other, okay? 
Okay, so that's it for uh, the lecture. Are there any questions on on the lecture at all? No, I think we're good. Okay. So let me share my other screen again. Of course, too, if you guys needed, uh, if you want to go back and take a look at something you didn't get, I'm going to record the lecture, or I, I am recording the lecture, I'm going to upload it uh, later today. And let's see, I'm going to make sure that we covered everything that I want to cover. Um, I think I mentioned Dr. Sue's procedures, right? Did I talk about that? You mentioned uh, there being a changing in the beginning and then went over okay. it, yeah. Okay, cool. It's, I, can't, I like mix up, uh, you know, if I talked about things in, in all my classes or not. So, but just to reiterate, Dr. Steele, she has new procedures that she made. I'm going to upload those new procedures, you know, sometime this weekend. You can look over that before the lab. So make sure that you guys show up to school next week because we do have our lab in person. We're going to meet an E42 in the beginning. We'll talk about some things before we head over. Uh, you're going to break off into groups. We'll go to the lab. I'll do the demo so you can see what to do. Then you guys will start working on the lab. I'll be walking around like all the time, making sure that you're good. And that's going to be the plan. So um, let's see. Oh, yeah. Also, yeah, we do have lab next week, as I've been mentioning i've had a few questions that or some confusion that you know monday is a holiday and i think in 225 and 226 for those labs if there was you know one lab that was canceled that week all of them were that's not the case for any of the other labs you're going to take throughout uh, undergrad so even though next monday is a holiday we're still going to have lab next week so make sure you show up I'll, I'll send out a reminder, but, um, you know, it's your responsibility. You got to make sure you show up next week. All right. So anyways, that's all I have for today. So hopefully you guys have a good weekend, a nice long weekend, and I'll see you in person uh, next Friday in E42. Sounds good. Thank you. Have a good one. Thank, Thank you. 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 Thank you. Have a good weekend, Professor. Or oh, sorry. You don't like being called Professor. I'm my bad. I don't care. <laughs> um, I did want to just have one last mention. Uh, I was the student who emailed you. I got it all mm -hmm. figured out, and I'm I'm in, and everything's all right. Okay, cool. Thank you for your help. Mm -hmm.